Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jay Hesselberth. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lucas Argueso, who is uh, down from Colorado State for the Cancer uh, Center Symposium today. So um, Lucas uh, was a graduate student with Eric Kalani at Cornell and moved on to uh, postdoctoral work uh, with Tom Peters at Duke with some brief stints in Brazil here and there uh, as well. Um, and in his you know, grad and postdoc work, uh, became very interested in uh, um, uh, DNA mutation and processes that lead to large-scale chromosome changes uh, in the form of loss of heterozygosity events. Um, and since his arrival at Colorado State in 2010, uh, he's continued that interest um, uh, looking at loss, you know, mechanisms underlying loss of heter heterozygosity in a number of contexts. Um, interestingly, in uh, a number of um, yeast strains used commercially for brewing and other applications. Um, so it's a pleasure to have Lucas. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Jay. So, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. I'm uh, always happy to come down and meet uh, colleagues here from this campus, and we try to make it here as, as often as we can, and you're always welcome to uh, take the short drive uh, north to, to meet us in Fort Collins. Uh, um, I believe many of you are familiar with our campus. At the very least, you're familiar with the mountains that you can see from here as well. So I, I don't need to show this slide for this. So uh, today I'm going to tell you about a story that began uh, several years ago as just a fun pursuit of trying to understand the phenotype in yeast cells. And we think it actually revealed something important about how genomes possibly in general, including uh, yeast and other eukaryotes, including hu humans, might be susceptible to a specific type of genomic instability process that we hadn't necessarily thought about uh, until now. So I'll, I'll kind of tell you both sides of this story. Uh, most of the work that I'm going to show you today was done by Nadia Sampaio, a graduate student in my lab, who's actually sitting right there. So you can ask her the questions, okay? So <laughs> save them for Nadia. <clears throat> and these are the folks who have funded the, our work. So uh, the work in my lab, as uh, Jay mentioned, is I'm really interested in structural genomic variation. So I'm interested in mutations of all kind, but particularly in the types of mutations that change the structure of the genome, that change copy number, or that change huge chunks uh, at a, one time. We know this is very important for human disease in the cancer context and in the genomic disorders context as well, and we think that they are relatively understudied uh, mechanisms of mutations. We've been looking at point mutations for a longer time that we've been looking at structural genomic variation. So this is the, the area where we think we might be able to make some contribution about fundamental mechanisms. I've always been a yeast geneticist using the yeast model system to study this problem. We think it's a suitable model for this because it has a small genome, so we get very high resolution, very deep coverage for the same uh, uh, types of instruments that are now available to use to look at the human genome, but with the amount of sequencing you need to sequence one human genome, you can do a thousand yeast genomes and get uh, about that, so it makes it affordable in that sense, and it has all the nice chromosomal organization with repeats, centromeres, telomeres, and things that resemble very closely the things that are going on inside our own genome, and the mechanisms, the, the enzymes, that the, the pathways that take care of mitotic and meiotic recombination, primarily the mechanisms associated with structural variation, are conserved and have actually been defined in that system. So we think this is a great model to look at this, and we do uh, what I call parallel approaches for studying this problem. Most of the work in my lab, I would say 70% of what we do, uses uh, what we, I call conventional lab yeast genetics, where we take these yeast strains that have been developed by the yeast uh, genetics community for a long time with all kinds of very interesting tools that you can use to study functional genomics, and we develop assays specifically to understand mechanisms of copy number variation, both in mitotic cells and in meiotic cells, and we study those mechanisms that way. There's another 30% uh, or so of my lab that tries to understand the same problem but using different types of strains. 
These strains here, the yeast lab strains, have been around for decades now, and they are essentially the best behaved strains you can possibly imagine. So the people who were developing them as tools, they were not interested in the very complicated things that sometimes nature presents to us, right? So they were looking at haploid strains that were very well behaved and they had tools that you could use. More recently though, it became evident that this species of yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is everywhere and it's present in all kinds of contexts in nature and in industry, in brewing and so on. And it turns out that these strains that are used industrially have very interesting genomes that in many ways might serve as a better model for understanding the complexities of the human genome than the haploid conventional lab strains that have been used in the past. So the idea is to use, apply the tools developed in the lab to these more complex strains to try to understand how these things happen in the context of complex genomes. So in this case, for example, we're interested both in how re genome rearrangements occur and what are their phenotypic consequences. So this is the part of the, the, our work that I'm going to focus on uh, today. So for that, I need to tell you about this specific strain. So as Jay uh, mentioned briefly, I have strong ties to Brazil. That's where I'm from. And in Brazil, there is, uh, is a highly, there's a highly developed system for production of bioethanol as a biofuel. It's produced from sugar cane that grows very efficiently in Brazil, produces a lot of sugar. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae, when presented with that, likes to make ethanol with it, just like you make when you're uh, brewing beer or, or making wine. The idea of that uh, uh, system is that you start with fresh sugarcane extract that contains a lot of sucrose, lots of sugar, add yeast to it, and after a few hours, it ferments and converts that sugar into ethanol. And once this is done, this goes through a centrifuge that separates the sugar, uh, the fermented sugarcane extract, and send yeast cells back into this tank. The reason this system uses cell recycling and this goes on for a very long time, about eight months of the year or so, is that sugarcane is not a product that you can store. So sucrose is highly uh, easily metabolizable by all kinds of microbes. So as soon as you harvest a sugarcane plant, you gotta use it immediately. If you don't, other organisms will go to town with it and, and eat it for you, and you can't make any alcohol from it. So you gotta harvest it and use it. Therefore, there is a high coordination between the agricultural part of this and the industrial production. You have to harvest and do this. So therefore, the industry has to run continuously for as long as you're harvesting sugarcane. The way to do this fast is to produce a lot of yeast cells. Each time you ferment, the cells grow a little bit. And then as you send more and more, this becomes a very high concentration system with lots of yeast cells that have to go on for a long time. Another feature here is this. The volume of sugar cane coming from here is very large. That means that it's not economical to sterilize it. So this is pretty much an open air fermentation system. Here's a picture of what it looks like. This is the top of one of these tanks. They are enormous and sugar cane extract fresh is coming from here. This guy is looking at that and all kinds of microbes that are in the environment have free access to this. So in order for a desired organism to be successful in the system, it needs to be able to be very aggressive and fend for itself, essentially kick everybody else out, okay? So a yeast strain that will do here, will do well here, has to be able to take care of its own. So here's what those tanks look like. They're about a million liters or so, and for scale, these are uh, the students in Brazil that were collecting those samples. This is what the bottom of that tank looks like, and this is where the centrifuges separate fermented ethanol from yeast, okay? All right, so that brings me into what kind of yeast uh, does well here. For a long time, when I was an undergraduate back in Brazil, the yeast lab that I worked on tried to develop better yeasts by crossing different ones and getting ones that would produce more et ethanol out of that uh, sugar you gave them. And they were great in the lab, but as soon as you put them in the real world environment, they would disappear immediately and the system would be taken over by wild yeast contaminants that did really well in that particular system, okay? So at some point, people gave up trying to breed yeast strains and decided to take a different approach. 
Let's look at what nature has out there and find strains that can both produce ethanol very efficiently and also be very aggressively to colonize the system and block the invasion of other undesirable yeasts, okay? So that uh, work was done all through the 90s, and by the end of uh, 2008 or so, they had a collection of strains that had those features. One of them is the strain that we study in my lab. It's known as PE2, and it's widely used in the Brazilian distilleries that produce ethanol. This, is, this strain is responsible for about half, almost half of all the biofuel that is produced in Brazil, and Brazil produces about the same amount of biofuel as the U.S. does. So it's a very economically important organism. It has very high fermentation kinetics. It does everything that the distil distillery manager wants. It kicks everybody out, and that's the main feature. So this is one uh, example of what it looks like. In this experiment, they started the sugarcane fermentation season with 1,000 kilograms of baker's yeast. Now, this is not a very good yeast for producing ethanol, but it's a good starter, something that will get the system going. And then they inoculated just half kilo of this PE2. After 30 days, when they came back to the industry, about <coughs> that baker yeast was gone. 60% of the culture was made of this aggressive but highly productive strain, and the rest were contaminants and progressively kicked out all of the contaminants. Now, in the next year, if you start the system with 1,000 kilograms of the blue strain, it will essentially block invasion by everybody else. So it's something that these managers really like to use. Up to that point, about 2009 or so, this organism, this PE2, was highly adopted by this industry, but they actually had no idea what it was. They knew it was yeast, but they didn't know the species and much less its genetics. So I became interested in this at that point, and decided to kind of do the genetic and molecular characterization of this organism. So at that point, this was right about the time when uh, next generation sequencing was taking off. So we decided to do some basic classic yeast genetics and couple that with whole genome sequencing to characterize what is it that we're working with. And it turned out that this strain has a very interesting genome. This uh, gel that I'm showing here is, what is a post-field gel electrophoresis example, and the bands that you're seeing are not PCR bands or restriction fragments. They're actually full-length yeast chromosomes from yeast. We can separate chromosomes from the smallest one, this band, about 250 kilobases, to the largest one, that is about 2.5 megabases. And because the genome is small, we actually have that resolution. The strain here on the left, S288C, is the reference genome for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the one that was sequenced back in 1996. This one here, JY270, is how we call PE2 in the lab, is our pure isolate of that strain. One thing you can see is that if you look at chromosome sizes, they have quite a bit of differences. It's kind of the same general pattern, the same number of chromosomes, but there are some uh, uh, chromosome size polymorphisms. One thing that is important is, for example, in certain positions, this band here corresponds to chromosome 11 of the reference genome, okay? In our strain, it actually, you can see two different bands of slightly different sizes that are both chromosome 11. So what this is saying is that this strain is a diploid, and the two homologs of chromosome 11, the maternal and the paternal, have structural variation between them that you can actually visualize in a post-field gel. At that time, in 2009, what we did was we obtained a haploid derivative from this strain. So yeast, you can induce it to undergo meiosis, and then you can culture the individual haploid products of that division. So we started with the industrial strain, sporulated, obtained the haploid derivative, and sequenced that. At the time, all we could afford and do was one haplotype out of that strain. We also sequenced at low coverage a sibling spore, and with that, we were able to determine that this diploid was actually highly heterozygous. There were a lot of positions in the genome where they were uh, different between the two homologs. So if you fast forward from 2009 to uh, recent years, what we've done next was to sequence many uh, haploids derived from these tetrads. So now we have 56 haploid genomes derived from 14 complete meiotic divisions. This data set was generated 
to reconstruct the, the, haplo the diploid genome in the parent strain and try to figure out that in a way that we can have phasing between the alleles, okay? I'm not going to tell you too much about this uh, 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 diploid genome, which is uh, the subject of a, a separate piece of work that we're working for next year. But what we've been able to learn from this is this in summary. This is the, these two lines represent two chromosomes of what the haploid lab strain yeast genome would look like, okay? So haploid, yellow chromosome, and blue chromosome. Our strain that we're studying is different because one, it's diploid, so you have two of each, and it's naturally diploid. Second, at the ends of the chromosomes, there are regions that are hemizygous, they're structurally different. So for example, in the yellow chromosome, at the right end here, there's a block of these orange genes, and in the other homolog, there's a different block of genes with different encoding for enzymes for different pathways that is purple. So this explains not only the structural variation, but the difference in sizes that we can visualize in the post-field gel from time to time. And this type of feature occurs uh, to our estimation in about 12 of the 16 chromosomes have abundant structural variation between the homologs. In addition to that, if you look for uh, repetitive D DNA sequences represented by these arrows, so for example, transposable elements that are inserted across the genome, they're different between the two uh, homologs. And on top of that, you have conventional heterozygosis represented by the axes and circles. So these are simple point mutations that are different between the two chromosomes. So with that, what I want to convey with this image is that this is a pretty complex genome, much uh, more elaborate than the genomes of the haploid yeast strains that we've been using to study uh, genomic uh, stability for uh, a few decades now. So what we think is that this could be a better model to understand these processes in complex genomes than the conventional lab strains are. So that's an avenue we're developing in the lab. Well, this is a, a, an image that kind of displays the heterozygosis that we were able to find in this particular strain. Let me guide you through it. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae has 16 chromosomes. Okay, this guy is diploid. In every position where you see kind of a half blue, half red uh, vertical line is a position where we've identified a point mutation that is heterozygous between the two. So there's lots of heterozygosis, but importantly, there's about 12,000 sites or so where we can find these. But importantly, what I want you to see is that this heterozygosis is not homogeneously distributed. It's actually, it's very patchy. There are chromosomes, for example, here, chromosome 11, that is highly heterozygous and has lots of these sites. And there are other chromosomes, like chromosome 1, that is completely homozygous. Both copies are the same. Other chromosomes, like chromosome 4, has a block of heterozygosis in the center and two terminal segments that are completely homozygous. What this says to us is that the strain that we have in our hands, the one that we analyzed, is simply a descendant of the original fully heterozygous strain that was formed in nature some time ago. This strain has undergone multiple loss of heterozygosity events where certain segments of the genome recombine with each other and then lose heterozygosis in one direction or another, okay? This is, uh, of course, a very important process in cancer development that is important for loss of tumor suppressor genes. So how do these things happen in, in our scenario and in the human case as well? So in this case, I'm showing the two copies of two heterozygous homologs of the yellow chromosome. Uh, LOH will often occur through a process that involves the repair of a double strand break. So imagine in this scenario, now this strain has already undergone DNA replication, <clears throat> so it's in G2. Imagine now you have this chromatid experience a break and instead of being repaired with the sequences from the sister chromatid, from time to time at a lower frequency, it will actually use as the template for repair a sequence in its homolog, which is very, very similar, but not identical. If it does so and uses a process of gene conversion, what it will do is it will unidirectionally, unidirectionally transfer information from this chromosome to that one, such that now you repair this with circles, but not with axes. And then as these chromatids segregate in the next cell division, you may end up with a cell, a daughter cell of that original one, 
that is now homozygous for this stretch of the genome. So it has what we call copy neutral loss of heterozygosity in an interstitial segment of the genome. Another way that this repair reaction can occur is the following way. You get the same break in one of the chromatids, but instead of doing a gene conversion repair, homologous recombination instead will do a, a crossover resolution where you actually exchange the flanking sequences and you end up with these two repair products where this segment has been transferred from bottom to top and this segment was transferred from the broken chromosome to below. As these cells now get ready to uh, divide and these chromatids segregate, you may end up with one product that is now homozygous for everything from the point of recombination to the terminal segment of the chromosome. So now this strain has both a, a proximal a copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. However, if the initial chromosomes, the initial homologs have structural variation in them, everything at distal to the position will become homozygous. So this act, strain will actually experience a deletion of this block of genes and a duplication of this block of genes. So you actually get a double whammy of LOH and CNV forming through the misrepair of the same event, okay? So this type of event, these terminal segments explain those big blocks of homozygosity that our strain, our starting strain has, okay? Well, all that introduction is to bring you to uh, the phenotype that led us to uh, uh, investigate LOH in this strain. Our strain, uh, JY27 ERP2, is very, very well behaved in the lab. It grows very fast. It forms yeast colonies that are round and smooth and do everything that we want them to do. However, on occasion, as we're plating these strains and doing experiments with them, every one in 10,000 colonies or so, we will see a colony that looks like this. They have a rough edge, they're flat, and you can spot them immediately because they look so different from the normal colonies of the parent strain, okay? The thing that really caught my eye, in addition to the shape, was the frequency of this mutation event. Okay, so these are not contaminants or anything. They're true descendants of this uh, strain. The thing that caught my eye is that these appear at about one in 10,000 colonies spontaneously. And as a mutation mechanism, if this was caused by a point mutation, you would expect this to occur at a much, much lower frequency, especially considering that this strain is diploid. So in order to see this phenotype, Whatever causal mutation would have to be dominant, and those are not that uh, easy to find, okay? So this, uh, this frequency really said there's gotta be some interesting recombination event that is happening here because these recombination events happen at much higher uh, uh, rates of, of mutation. So we decided to investigate this. First, we wanted to take a closer look at what the colonies are. And this is what the normal strain looks like. And one of these rough isolates looks like this. If you look at them under the microscope, these have normal budding yeast that separate the mother from the daughter cell, okay? And they look like this, dispersed, while these kind of grow in chains. The mother and daughter cells don't really dissociate on their own and they remain like a, a, a grapes. They're all attached to the same uh, structure. If you use a stain, that uh, looks at the interface between a mother and a daughter, a region that we call a bud neck in yeast. So this calcofluor white specifically stains bud necks. And you can see that the attachment between mother and daughter still remains at the bud neck. So this suggests some kind of defect in mother-daughter cell separation, okay? We wanted to do some classic yeast genetics to understand what was going on. And that was the first surprise that we had. We took, if we take our strain, the normal one, the smooth, induce it to undergo meiosis and separate and cultivate the four haploid products of it, all haploid products form smooth colonies. If we take, however, one of the ones that have uh, this rough colony phenotype and they undergo meiosis, they generate also four products that are also uh, smooth. So the phenotype kind of disappears if you get to the haploids. That was a real head scratcher, because, okay, so what's going on? How can this be? Why did the phenotype go away? Is it not hardwired genetically? So I thought this is going to be a nightmare to figure out, and then I pretty much gave up on it. So I'm not even going to look into this. 
Until one day, one of the students in the lab told me, hey, I'm having a problem. Every time I, I, I cross two specific descendants of the smooth strain, I always get these funny looking diploids that have a rough colony phenotype. And I can't for the life of me, I've tried it a hundred times, I always get the same result. And then that was when we kind of figured out that this phenotype was diploid specific. So haploids don't show it, but when you have a diploid, that's when you are able to see this phenotype. This uh, enabled us to recapitulate the phenotype independently and gave us an avenue for discovering what the causal gene was. To do that, what we did was this. We had a bunch of haploids that we had already sequenced for the other project we were working on. So what we did was this. We took all mat A. This is the equivalent of the male or female gender in this case. So these haploids, mat A, will always mate with mat alpha haploids. If we get the two together, we will either get smooth or rough colonies. By doing this matrix of crossing every six haploids that are met A to six haploids that are met alpha, and looking at the outcome, rough or smooth, we, can, we are able to deduce what kind of allele they have. If you always get uh, a smooth uh, diploid formed from one of these parents, you can deduce that these guys must have the wild type functional allele that makes the colonies look smooth. If, however, anytime you join two of these guys and they form a rough colony, you deduce that they must have whatever mutant allele is for that gene. Now, because we have all of these 12 genomes sequenced, we can look at the SNPs that segregate between them and ask for the, for the ones that are always the same in this group and always the opposite one in this group through this co-segregation analysis. Another test we did was we took one of the uh, spontaneously generated rough colonies and did the same thing, generated six haploids from this guy and six one that were mat alpha, and every time we crossed them, we always got a rough colony. What this says is that this uh, uh, rough colony somehow became homozygous for that causal allele and that's an indication that the process of mutation here is likely loss of heterozygosity, okay? So now what we did was we looked for co-segregation between these 12,000 or so uh, segregating alleles, and we looked for things that co-segregated in one group versus the other. So in the blue group, those were the guys that we inferred to have the wild type allele, and in the red group were the ones that we inferred had to have the mutant allele. When we did this, we identified two regions only in the whole genome, one on chromosome 11, and there's nothing exciting there, and one on chromosome 12, and by simply looking at the annotations of these genes, we were able to spot this guy here, ACE2, that had to be the one, the culprit for this. Okay, so this was the fastest genetic mapping experiment ever, once we had all the data and we knew what to look for. So, when we looked at ACE2, and that, the reason we knew this had to be it was by click, click, click in the genome browser, we ended up getting to a paper that had this figure, okay? And I said, oh, this looks a lot like what we're dealing with. ACE2 is a gene that encodes a transcription factor required for this mother-daughter cell separation. And it turns out that it actually has a diploid-specific phenotype. Haploids are always smooth if they have a wild type uh, a version of this particular gene here. However, diploids can have this rough colony phenotype when they are mutant for ACE2. The reason this uh, diploid or haploid specific phenotype occurs is that it turns out that the budding pattern of haploids and diploids is different. Haploids tend always to bud in the opposite direction or the axial pair, uh, pattern. So if this is the mother and daughter, the next time they bud, they will opposite, they will bud right next to that. So as this bud grows, and this bud grows, it essentially pushes on grandmother and mechanically separates the two daughter cells. Diploids, on the other hand, have a bipolar pattern of, of budding such that if they do this, they keep growing in opposite directions, and that chain of cells keeps growing, okay? So this explains the phenotype. Now, we really got into this because of recombination, and we wanted to look at that problem, okay? So what we did was we looked at that specific region of the genome, and we found that our strain indeed is heterozygous at that site. 
This is a region inside the ACE2 gene. The wild type allele has a region with eight A's in this homopolymer run, while the other allele has seven A's, so this creates a frame shift uh, shortly downstream of that position. The, if you sequence with Sanger sequencing the, the normal diploid heterozygous strain, you get this pattern where everything downstream from that position, you have double peaks, meaning that they are kind of out of register. And if you look at the spontaneous rough colonies, they are homozygous for that uh, seven base pair position. So we called this allele ACE2A7, this frame shift mutation, okay? All right, so now uh, we did other tests to demonstrate that this was actually copy neutral LOH. They were not caused by a deletion of the wild type allele in any of the cases. So they had to be due to some kind of recombination event. Uh, we did another uh, complementation test to actually demonstrate that that one minus one deletion of one uh, A base was responsible for this. So we took the two initial mutant alleles that gave us the phenotype, replaced the allele, kind of healed that position by editing the genome, and any time we changed just that one base, we were able to completely revert the phenotype. So we knew that that position was causal for that phenotype. Okay, but how did they, these uh, rough colonies arise if you start with a heterozygous strain? This is a close-up map of chromosome 12. This is where this position, this gene is in the genome. And interestingly, in this strain and in other heterozygous YOD strains that have been studied before, the chromosome 12 has an interesting configuration. One thing that is the hallmark of chromosome 12 in Saccharomyces cerevisiae is that it is the home for the ribosomal DNA genes, uh, ribosomal RNA genes, meaning that there's a cluster here of about 100 repeats or so encoding the ribosomal RNA. And it turns out that this is a region of high genomic instability. There's a lot of recombination that goes on there. So our strain is actually heterozygous for every position to the left of here and is already homozygous, experienced an LOH event for everything down there. So we can only look at heterozygosity on this side. There's nothing to see on the other end, okay? ACE2 is about there. When we look at the, the status of heterozygosity in the five initial rough colonies that we saw, here's what we saw. So this is uh, an experiment using simply PCR and restriction fragment mapping for specific SNPs along this chromosome. And what we can see is that the original strain is heterozygous at every position, blue or red. And in each of the rough colonies that have this phenotype of the five that we initially obtained, they were always homozygous, red, red, at that particular position, and that's that A homopolymer run inside AC2. However, LOH is not a local mutation event. It's a regional mutation event because it can affect long tracks of, of recombination. In this case here, in one allele, it was only at that position, but in the other four that we looked at, it actually involved a mitotic crossover between the two homologs. So they were homozygous at the causal gene, but also for the whole region surrounding that, okay? So this kind of told us that these were due to uh, copy neutral loss of heterozygosity because of mitotic recombination. Now, one thing that really we were not expecting to see was this. One of the clones, this guy, JY664, not only had this track of homozygosity going from red blue to blue to red red, but it actually on the other chromosome arm, a region that is pretty distant, he had a secondary LOH event going in the other direction, which told us that this was an independent recombination event because it was going in the other direction in a different region. Now, this, each of these events is about a one in 10,000 event or so. So this one is about one in 10,000. So the odds that we would find just out of the blue, a strain that had two recombination events in opposite directions in the same chromosome really said there had to be something else going on here because this is too much coincidence. So we decided to look more closely at this particular clone, JY664. What we did first was we, what we do for general copy number variation in the lab, we do a race CGH. So what this is showing is the distribution of copy number across the entire genome and we do post-field gels. 
in the array CGH experiment, there was nothing remarkable except for this position where there's a big deletion on chromosome six. Remember, the region we selected this clone for is right here on chromosome 12. We did not select it for having anything on chromosome six. If we look at the post field gel, this is the parent strain and this is the rough mutant. You can tell there's a lot of chromosomal uh, bands that change size. Look at this position here. So these are the two uh, different copies of chromosome six, a long and a short. And in this one, the long chromosome six actually reduced in size to be down here. If you take a closer look at the array CGH plot at this position, most regions of six are present at two copies, but this terminal side here on the right side actually is present at one copy, saying that this strain has a big deletion, including essential genes there, that is causing this strain to uh, lose a chunk of the genome. Again, an unselected, very rare event. These are about one in 100,000 uh, frequency normally. The same strain, JY664, at another position, this is chromosome 11, Again, the, the chromosome size polymorphism is easy to detect in the parent strain. And now this is what occurred in 664. This chromosome reduced in size. If we look at the array CGH, we can see that there's normal copy number throughout the chromosome, except at the very tip where the signal from the probes completely disappeared. It went from normal to zero. If we take a closer look, you can see this better. Normal copy number there, and then these, the signal for these probes are, is gone as if they were deleted. So it turns out, though, that these arrays were designed for the reference genome, which only has one or the other version of these blocks of genes at the ends of chromosomes. So this is kind of, our strain, though, looks different. It has these hemizygous terminal regions. So the regions that are represented, uh, there are two blocks, only one of which is represented in this microarray, okay? The 664 had the following organization as we detected it. It was still heterozygous for these regions closer to the centromere. It was now homozygous for this uh, particular marker here closer to the end of the chromosome. And now it had associated with this LOH event a CNV event where it went from being hemizygous for two regions for now losing the orange block, that's what's represented in the microarray, and duplicating these regions, these green regions that are exclusive to this industrial strain. They don't even appear in the reference strain microarray. So again, a proximal LOH coupled with a terminal deletion duplication CNV. So high level uh, reorganization of the genome that if we were using a, a, a diploid homozygous lab strain, we could never detect this event because the strain is fully homozygous, okay? So all in all, this particular strain, 664, actually had seven unselected LOH events, each of which is very rare. So what this is saying is that these events are, have some kind of association. They're not being explained by simple independent occurrences. So something had to be up. So this genome experienced extensive rearrangement and the question arose, is this really an oddball, an odd case, or is this a common pattern that is representative of LOH occurring in, a, in an eukaryotic genome like this? So we decided to investigate this problem. So the question is, is there something happen, happening systematically across the genome, meaning that whatever causes one event is happening to the whole cell and not just to that one region of the genome where you detect the recombination event, thus making the occurrence of unselected events more frequent than expected. So if rough colonies then are often associated with these events, we would expect that selecting the first event should give you many more unselected events at a higher than expected rate. Likewise, if we take strains that are heterozygous, grow them, and do not select for the first event, now you should not see that many more appearing in unselected fashion. So we did two experiments uh, to test this. The first, we wanted to look at what happens if we do not select the primary event. We did two tests for that. In the first test, we took strains that were smooth to begin with, heterozygous at our marker site, grew them, plated, and selected 29 clones, that were still smooth, so they did not experience the primary LOH event. 
Then we ran uh, pulse field gels to look for genome rearrangement. We saw that for these guys, we could not detect changes in chromosome 5 in any of the ones where we did not select the primary event. The second test was we took the same strain and we did a more strict test where we propagated them for about 300 generations or so and asked to see, has anything changed in the genome, at least at the resolution of a post-field gel? And what we saw was nothing. We couldn't see anything. The other test was this. Okay, what if we now select the initial event? So this is what the genomes look like. All chromosomes from beginning to end look exactly the same way except for this region up here, which is an exception. This is a ribosomal DNA rearrangement that is a kind of goes through a different mechanism. Now, in the other case, what we did was we selected the primary event. So we grew cultures, and we selected 20 additional independent spontaneous rough copies. So we already have five that we didn't really intend to select, and then we purposely went to search for more, and we very easily found 20 more. And then we did two tests. The first one, we looked at the, by PCR, at the ACE2 site. All of them have copy neutral LOH as expected. And then we decided to use whole genome sequencing to look elsewhere in the genome and say, okay, what else changed? We also did post field gels to see, have any other chromosomes changed size? And it turns out that seven out of the 25 had a visible chromosomal rearrangement that we could detect. Mind you, this is an extremely low resolution test. So the fact that we could see chromosome size changes that are only detectable in a small fraction of the genome really told us that, told us that these events had to be abundant. The whole genome sequencing, though, gave us the full picture of what's happening. This is the plot of heterozygosity for chromosome 12 alone. This is the region where the primary selected event is. Heterozygous in the parent strain, and each of the rough colonies is homozygous at that particular position. What I want you to see is that they have tracks of heterozygosity that we wanted to, to see. This guy here is 664, the one going in the opposite direction, the one that first drew our attention to this problem. Now, if we look at the other regions of the genome, the whole genome where we did not select, here's what we found. Again, this is the selected site. All the clones have it. But now these clones have lots and lots of these unselected events everywhere else. So these are regions that we did not ask, ask for. They came along for the ride. These guys are rare, though. It's a very high coincidence that they appear after selecting for LOH here. In fact, based on, so the rate of mitotic recombination in yeast has been measured and well characterized. So we have a defined number that we can use to predict how many of these we should see if we didn't select for them. So this is the, the number. Out of 25 clones, we should see 24 that do not have any tracts of LOH, and maybe in that bunch, one of them should have one tract. In blue is what we actually saw. So about 12 of them didn't have anything else in addition to this selected chromosome 12, but then we had a bunch with one, bunch with two, some with three, and one outlier that had seven. That's 664, the guy that we just uh, were, were first interested in. So this is a very high number. But, and they said that there had to be some relationship between selecting the first event and seeing these other ones that are associated. But still didn't completely answer the, the question, though, because this. It could be that becoming homozygous at chromosome 12 itself is the cause of genome instability that gives you these associated events. So what we really needed to do was to recapitulate this observation in a way that was completely independent of the rough colony business that I first uh, told you about. So then we set out to do a new experiment. <clears throat> Here's what we did. We used two counter-selectable markers in yeast that were uh, hemizygous in this case. In this case, this is, has the URA3 gene that we can select against by resistance to a drug called 5-FOA. This one is the CAN1 gene that we can select against for resistance to a drug called Canavan. Okay? So this one is inserted on chromosome 4. This one is inserted on chromosome 5. And they should be independent. These are different molecules in different regions of the genome. And we shouldn't see one going with the other if the events are independent. So what we did was we measured 
the rate of this event, the measure of this event, and if they were independent, the rate of getting the two in the same cone should be about the multiplication between the two rates. So we measured the rate for four, it's about six times 10 to the minus five. The rate for chromosome five is about five times 10 to the minus five. Therefore, the rate of the double, if the two events are independent, should be about 10 to the minus nine, or a really, really rare event, okay? When we did the, these experiments, here's what we found. Let me walk you through this figure. In the first uh, panel here is the experiments done in that industrial strain, JY270. This is the rate of individual LOH at these chromosomes. This is the expected rate of LOH of double events, for example, for chromosome four and five, is the multiplication of this number by that number. This is what we expect, and this is what we actually got, a number that is about 100-fold, or 50 to 100-fold higher than expected. Same thing if we look at a pair 13 or five. This experiment is now done in a completely different strain background. This is the lab strain, okay? We can make it diploid and look for the same event. This is the rate of single LOH, the expected rates of single LOH, and the actual rate of double. So what this is saying is that these events somehow, even though they're in different regions of the genome, they're not occurring independently. So what we think is there's something happening globally, systemically to that cell that precipitates a burst of genomic instability. There's one possibility that we needed to rule out though, which is this. Diploid yeast strains are known to, even though if you're growing them in a um, rich medium, at a very, very low rate, they will occasionally enter the meiotic cell division program and undergo a burst of recombination because of meiosis. So we wanted to rule out that meio meiosis, or a mechanism known as return to growth, was not causing this. So what we did was we took this strain and deleted one of the mating type <laughs> loci. So what this does is, even though this strain is diploid, it thinks it is haploid, and everything that is uh, required for meiosis is completely shut off. So this guy is unable to enter meiosis, and the phenotype still exists unaffected. So we know this gotta be a mitotic event. So at that point, we ended kind of the initial characterization that we think this is real. We see it with the chromosome 12 selection, we see this by this uh, 5-FOA and cannabinoid selection, and we can have a handle of that. Now, that still doesn't tell us the mechanism. How is this happening? And there's a lot of ideas that we have. Some of them uh, are described here. So we know it's not because chromosome 12 itself that, that we've been able to eliminate. We know this is not an a, a cryptic initiation of meiosis somehow, so we eliminated that. But then that tells us there is some kind of systemic genomic recombination that is independent of meiosis. We think of two mechanisms that can do this. The first one is uh, an idea that has been shown before is that as cells age, they begin to have high levels of genomic instability, particularly loss of heterozygosity. I'll show you a figure in, in a second. The other one, there's an idea that we're uh, kind of, it's growing on us, is the following. Maybe simply the fact that gene expression is not the same in every cell might be sufficient to explain this. The idea is this. Imagine there's a network of 100 genes or so that are very important for maintaining the structure of the genome, and if you lose one of them, now the rate of mutation goes up. Now every cell is expressing these genes, right? But since there is stochasticity, you could easily think that in a population of 100 million cells, for example, there's one cell that just completely did not express a really important DNA repair gene. And for that one moment, that cell is essentially behaving as a knockout. As it doesn't have that gene product, it experiences a failure in DNA repair. But as those, that cell divides, now the gene is turned back on and now it carries those mutations stably as it propagates. So we think that this mechanism alone is sufficient to explain these bursts of genomic instability. Aging is another one. So as cells age, and this is work that, uh, classic work that Michael McMurray developed as he, uh, here from your campus as a graduate student in Gottschling's lab, 
he showed very quickly in heroic experiments that as cells, these cells age, the rate of uh, LOH increases. And this is shown as these uh, colored uh, sectors in the, these circles, just saying that young cells do not have them, older cells do. So since in our system we're growing cells for long periods of time, we're giving them a chance to get old, to live their whole uh, lifespan and experience these, these events. So because we grow them for a long time, they are susceptible to aging, kind of the full uh, lifespan. Okay, so with that, I'm going to, uh, so we still don't know what's causing this, but we're very convinced it's real and we want to find out. The other thing that really makes this attractive is that there are recent uh, results looking at heterogeneity in, in, in tumor cells that shows that there are patterns of mutation that can only be explained by bursts of genomic instability followed by periods of uh, uh, correct propagation of whatever mutations were accumulated. So a pattern that is different from a progressive and kind of uh, slow incremental accumulation of mutations. We think that what we're seeing in yeast might be able to recapitulate the same fundamental mechanism. So that's what all this text tells you. So with that, I want to thank you, show a picture of my lab minus uh, one person, but uh, this is almost all of us, and I'm happy to take questions. So. Instability is a ring. There's another thing that majorly determines mutations and particularly chromosomal rearrangements in the population is purified selection. Mm -hmm. So if purified selection is strong, you'll get rid of the ones that happen. And if purified selection is weak, they can persist. So right. I wonder if you've taken that into account in terms of the, you know, in other words, your initial rates may be based on stronger purifying selection than what you're getting when you're actually getting these combined. True, but, but that, what that says is that what we're measuring is an underestimate of the full spectrum of yeah. mutation, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, uh, yes, I agree. So we're not seeing the full picture. The other thing that we're not seeing is that because our strain is only heterozygous, the industrial one, is only heterozygous in 60% of the genome, anything that happens in the other 40%, we're still not seeing. So we're seeing a huge increase for the, only the small window that we can see. We're actually uh, adding a, a follow-up experiment where we're looking at a strain that is 100% marked everywhere. So we can presumably detect most events. Yep. So it seems in this strain from uh, our strain from Brazil, a lot of uh, large number of changes occur in the end. So the question is whether or not uh, uh, so uh, you're correct that the strain does have those uh, blocks of structural variation at the ends, uh, but there are two features. One is the, the strain we're starting with. The rearrangements we detect are actually most often internal. So about 60% uh, of them are interstitial segments inside, and the ones that are terminal are hundreds of KB away from those regions. Uh, yeah. Do you see any correlation with the nutrition, with the nutrient availability, with the loss of tumors velocity? Uh, we have not looked at that, but our strain, the ones we started these experiments, is a wild strain, fully prototrophic for everything. The only nutritional mutation it has is a urea 3 deletion that we put in there so we could do the LOH experiment. But the ones that we sequenced were actually urea plus, plus plus actually. So, but we didn't specifically ask that question. Is a plan to take, for example, mutations with premature aging and see how those affect people? Uh, that's one of the, the, so we have some candidates that we want to investigate, some of the things that would cause aging, and then the other things we are doing is we can, because these events are relatively easy to select for, we can select them from young cultures and from old cultures and see if the number of secondary events is fundamentally different between the two groups. 
and we can perturb the function of specific genes associated with that too. We can also, we're thinking of finding some mutants that can actually increase the noise in gene expression overall in cells. So if cells that have uh, noisier expression, meaning they're more susceptible to having these odd cells that misexpress fundamental uh, DNA repair genes, do they experience more of this systemic instability effect? So there's all the functional part of this. It's what's coming in the next uh, couple of years at least, and we have some ideas. Has a certain mutation gives rise to progeria, premature aging. Uh -huh. But if you have a different kind of mutation, you get increased mutations in cancer. So the question is, if you stuck that in there, for example, yeah. each gene, I don't know whether you can even do that. You know, would you get what you, you know, which one would give you yeah. the, the aging or the DNA repair? We'll have to find out. All right, I'm going to present it. Damned if you do, and damned if you do. That's right. Yes. Um, I've always wondered about how like protein regulation relates to like uh, recombination. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have, so, so far the regions we have identified don't f seem to obey any specific rule. There's nothing that seems common between them except that they are in different regions of the genome. But that's certainly possible. It could be some regions. If there's, imagine there's a global event, a systemic event that is something going wrong with that whole cell. Could be, for example, the mechanisms that set up specific chromatin structures. And if you, in that one cell, they are perturbed, those are the regions that would be vulnerable. As we get more and more events, we might be able to see some of these patterns. So far, we don't have enough for that. Okay. We have not looked at that. Because our strain is diploid, it's a different background. I'm not sure we could directly map that to the 3D structure of the haploid lab strain that has been mapped. We have not. Yeah. Um, a lot of times when there's alterations in DNA damage responses, there's uh, impact on the activity. Have you guys looked at that at all? We have not, no. Okay, sorry, we, we haven't done much more than uh, characterizing this event, but I'll be happy to come back in a couple of years. We'll see what we got. Thank you.